Um, can you take a seat, please? Excellencies, dear colleagues, dear students, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome you tonight and uh, to invite you uh, to listen to a lecture by our guest, uh, Ivan Krastev, um, whom we are very pleased to have uh, here, back at the uh, Graduate Institute, uh, Ivan Krastev uh, has regularly taught uh, here, and uh, we greatly hope that he will come back uh, to give another round of lectures to our students. Um, Ivan is uh, a very influential person, um, not only in Europe, uh, uh, as the president of uh, a Bulgarian uh, think tank, Center for Liberal Strategies, as a permanent fellow of the Institute uh, of uh, Human Science, uh, over which uh, our colleague, uh, Professor Shalini Randeria, uh, presides. Uh, and uh, he is also very um, influential uh, across the Atlantic as an open-ed uh, columnist for the New York Times. Uh, and as you will uh, hear from his presentation, is really somebody whose voice uh, has a great uh, weight because of his uh, intelligence, his uh, talent, uh, um, and I would say is uh, um, very sharp mind, which uh, is uh, ready to see uh, to whoever has the chance, as we have in this uh, place, uh, to meet and uh, benefit uh, from uh, his uh, conversation. So thank you, um, Ivan, and uh, you have the floor. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. And Kissinger used to say that one of the reasons people go and give talks is for the pleasure of being introduced. So <laughs> thank you very much. It's <laughs> I should say that probably I'm uh, less influential than you were told. Uh, but what I'm trying to, uh, what I'll try to do is the following. Uh, uh, I published recently a book, which was lucky one, which was translated quite a lot, and it was about Europe. And uh, it had a title which uh, my publisher didn't like for good reason. Uh, and it was called Perhapsburg. And it was about European Union. It was kind of uh, published under the title in English after Europe, and then in different languages, everybody was finding a different title that uh, they like most. I'm just going to use this to sketch an argument coming from this book, because I do believe that there is something important about the European uh, uh, crisis that we see today, and from this point of view, the, the East European and West European view differ on something which is different than simply interest and values and legacies, but there is one important existential difference. All of us, nevertheless where we stand politically, have seen the collapse of a major political system in our personal biographies. From this point of view, we know how fragile any political construction could be. This is not what is the experience of any Westerner, be it academic, be a citizen. So when I was writing this book, I was trying basically much more to try to bring this sensitivity when I'm analyzing certain things that we're seeing today. So it was in one of the last June days of uh, 1914, 
when in a distant garnison city on the border of the Habsburg Empire, a telegram arrived. And it was just one sentence, and it was on capital letters, and the text was, there are rumors that uh, the heir of the throne have been assassinated. And there was a, such a shock that immediately one of the officers, Hungarian by origin, started speaking Hungarian to his compatriots. Another officer, being Slovene, became very nervous about this. And he said, I insist that everybody speaks German only. And then the Hungarian officer said, OK, I can say it also in German. We are happy that the bastard is gone. Uh, and this is the way Philip Roth, in his magnificent novel, Radetzky March, describes the end of the Habsburg Empire, the moment in which everybody starts speaking their national languages. And of course, one of the question with uh, the different political things that we see in Europe these days is to what extent we are facing a similar risk? To what extent, basically, our societies, our governments started to speak their own languages only? To what extent, basically, we are losing this common political language? I'm saying this because I do believe for the last five years, European Union was going through four quite important and fundamental crises which are changing its perception about itself and also the world. The first, of course, is the Brexit. And Brexit, I'm not going to comment on the economic or political dimension of it. Uh, but from my point of view, what is the most important about Brexit is that after Brexit, nobody can take European Union for granted. If before the disintegration of the European Union was such a kind of a, an interesting theoretical option that we have a tens of theories about European integration, but we don't have a, any single theory about European disintegration. Uh, and people believe that it was simply unthinkable. Now, first, we know that it is possible, but secondly, we don't know what the disintegration of European Union means. Is it enough for three more countries to leave in order to claim that European Union disintegrate? Is it going to be important if Bulgaria and Romania decide to leave? Secondly, if is we're going to pretend that European Union is still there if half of the countries decided basically much more to become out of liberal democracy authoritarian regimes. Is it going to be the same union? So from this point of view, what is the meaning of disintegration is also something that we have not discussed much. The second crisis, of course, very much debated, and I'm uh, sure that here there was a lot of uh, much more knowledgeable people talking about this, was the uh, Eurozone uh, and the Euro crisis. But what interests me in this crisis is uh, not its e economic content and not simply the questions it asks about the institutional design uh, 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 of European Union, but there is something totally different. Because also the Euro crisis not simply divided Europe between South and North, but between debtors and creditors. And unfortunately, this is a power relationship. Unlike the relations between rich and poor, the relations between creditor and debtor is a power relationship. So how political equality in the European Union is going to function when you have such a strong power relationship? Uh, the third crisis was, of course, the Russia-Ukrainian crisis, the annexation of Crimea. And this was critically important because it also challenged the very notion of security on which the European Union is based. And it was based on the idea that economic interdependence is dramatically reduces the risk of war, and that in a certain way military power is something of the past, and what what really matters is a soft power. And then comes uh, the Russia-Ukrainian crisis, and then we start to realize something that historians have been writing for a long time, that it is true that economic interdependence reduces the risk of war, but only under the condition that participating parties has a positive trade expectations. When they have a negative trade expectations, economic interdependence can increase the risks of war. And secondly, the military power looks unimportant till the moment when you, don't, you realize that you don't have it. Uh, and then basically you start to, uh, to view it differently. But uh, I'm saying all this because I'm going to claim in front of you, and as I said it, I'm much more going to make an argument. I'm not going to do the details. I'll be very happy after that to discuss. But I'm going to claim to you that it was the migration crisis that in a certain way is going very much to shape the European Union. And paradoxically, this is the only pan-European of the three crises. 
Nevertheless, that in most of the European Union member states, there are no refugees or migrants. Uh, just to, to give you an uh, idea of what we're talking about, in a country like Slovakia, in the year 2015, when a million people went to Germany, there were 168 refugees going, and eight of them got asylum. Uh, but why I'm saying that this is basically uh, the crisis that is going to shape uh, the European Union and which is going to have the most important impact on European domestic politics? Because paradoxically, this is the migration crisis that forced the Europeans to see themselves and the world around them differently. So from this point of view, I'm going to make a comparison with the 9-11 in the United States. Listen, 3,000 people being killed in New York is a tragedy. But this is not the biggest number of tragedy that we know about the world. But these 3,000 people made America see the world totally differently, trying to see globalization totally differently, trying to see its place in the world totally differently. And I do believe from this point of view, it was the migration crisis that basically, uh, the refugee crisis that makes uh, 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 Europe uh, perceiving itself uh, 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 in, a very, in a very different way. I'm starting with the fact that when I'm going to talk about migration crisis, and I'm going to explain you why I'm using migration and refugees for the moment, uh, knowing very well how different they are in legal terms uh, as a synonymous, I'm going to be interested not simply in the migration of the flow of people that came to Europe in the last years. By the way, this is a negligible number. The people who came to Europe starting with 2015 represents 0.5% of the population of the European Union. Uh, this is much smaller number than refugees that are hosted at Turkey at this very moment. So this is not what, in my view, is important about the crisis. But I do believe in order to understand the migration crisis as a transformative moment for the European Union and European politics, we should try to understand the migration crisis, also the migration of the vote, and particularly the migrations of the working class vote from the center left uh, to the far right, just to give you one example, on the second round of the presidential elections in Austria, 90% of the blue collar workers voted uh, for the Freedom Party, for the far right party. This is also uh, the uh, migration of arguments. If in the 1970s, there were much more people on the left who were going to use kind of a cultural uh, and anthropologic argument and saying, listen, there are differences. You cannot push, for example, on uh, the Indian villages, uh, 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 your plans. They have the right to defend their way of life. Now the same argument is very much used by much more conservative voices who said it's about also the Europeans who has the right to defend their way of life. And also this is, uh, and I'm going to touch uh, on this, very much the migration of certain type of political identities. So what is so important about migration? George Saramago, the Nobel Prize, uh, 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 a Portuguese novelist, has a beautiful novel called Death with Interruptions. And it tells the story of a society in which suddenly people stop dying. In January, nobody died. In February, nobody died. In March, nobody died. People became euphoric. And then, in April, certain type of practical and metaphysical problems started to arise. First, what the insurance companies. They say, listen, if nobody is dying, we are dying. <laughs> and then came the church. If nobody is dying, nobody is resurrecting. Uh, and then basically there were people who were taking care of an old and uh, uh, sick people who said, is this going to be forever? So probably with the Bulgarian participation, but they organized a smuggling channel uh, to get some of uh, the old and sick people uh, to be smuggled outside in the neighboring country where the people were still dying. Uh, and then uh, the prime minister in the last moment uh, of the, the last episode of the book goes to the uh, king and said, your majesty, if we don't start dying, we don't have a future. Uh, I'm telling this to you because the most important, I do believe this book's better than anything, describes Europe's relations to the world without borders. On one level, this is the best thing that happened to us. On the other thing, this is the worst thing that we fear. And overnight, globalization changed its symbolism. Before, globalization was the tourist. He comes, he spends, he likes what he sees, he's not bothering with your problems, with his problems, and he's leaving. 
And then comes the refugee, which in many cases is the same person. He or she comes, stays, but what is even much more important, brought with herself all the problems of the world. So paradoxically, if yesterday attracting tourists was what the globalization was about, now stopping refugees became the major objective uh, for, uh, for many European countries. Because what is interesting about migration, and this is basically where uh, I, I'm going to make my next argument. We can claim that migration is the 21st century revolution. Uh, but this is a revolution that does not need communist manifesto, does not need an avant-garde party, uh, which is very much an individual act. It is not a collective act. You need yourself, your, enemy, uh, your family, and probably your mobile phone. Uh, but in a world which is so much connected, in a globalized world, we are living also in a world of global comparisons. In 1981, when the World Value Survey started, they had this question about happiness. And back then, Nigerians were as happy as West Germans. There was no positive correlation between happiness and wealth. 20 years later, Nigerians were as happy as their GDP is going to predict. What has happened, probably many things, but the most important is that the Nigerians got television sets. They can see how the West Germans live. So we are living in a world where people do not compare themselves with the person next to them. They compare themselves with those who has best and probably most interesting lives. And in the world of a global comparisons, in which also some of the nationalistic and other type of passions are down, if you really want to change your life, better change the country than change your government. Because you can do it in one generation. And uh, we're also particularly keeping in mind that as Aron noticed already 50 years ago, these days the inequality between people are becoming much more important than inequality between the social classes. Because the strongest predicator of how much money you're going to have in your life and how long you're going to live and so on is not your education or the education of your parents, but where you're born. And in this, uh, there is this uh, famous book, the, uh, the, uh, the Birth uh, uh, Right Watery, which is very much uh, 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 making this argument. In this world of a social inequality, in a certain way, the major idea of the social change is crossing the border of the state and not basically taking the position of the government. But if this is the case, paradoxically, Europeans discovered themselves as a counter-revolutionary power. The idea that many of these people, at least in our imagination, really wants to come to Europe. Till yesterday, we're going to call it soft power. Till yesterday, this is going to be perceived as the indication of the attractiveness of Europe. Today, this is exactly what bothers uh, uh, many of uh, European uh, voters. And secondly, migration also, in political terms, uh, made a change which is still not articulated. But I do believe people are going to start talking more and more. We believe that we are living in a post-Cold War world, which means that most of our explanations, most of the frames which we are working with, particularly in Europe and the United States, was coming and based on the Cold War. Migration made decolonization and not Cold War the most important thing that happened in the second half of the 20th century. In a certain way, it was decolonization and not the Cold War, what was our common history. And in a certain way, we are not intellectually also prepared, particularly Europeans, for this. Uh, because in a certain way, this is something that we have been trying to avoid. And also something that the migration crisis also made very evident is that if you go to the universalist appeal to Europe, and particularly to very much the universalist ideology of uh, different European voters on the left and on the right, you're going to see two kinds of universal ideologies that were critically important for this. One was the Catholic Church, sure. And the other was uh, 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 Marxism, which also basically believed that uh, it's proletarians all over the world that have much more in common than uh, uh, different tribal or other identities. Paradoxically, both of them, in the migration crisis, suffered in Europe a big crisis. Look who are one, which are one of the most migration resentful countries and societies in the European Union. Some of the most Catholic ones, Poland, Hungary. Paradoxically, we saw the nationalization of the Catholic Church. 
we Orthodox know it, but I do believe it's going to be new for the Catholics. Uh, Catholicism very much is about being Paul or being Hungarian, and the fact that the Pope was very supportive uh, for the migrants uh, make people resentful to the Pope and not much following them. And the same basically on the left. Uh, after the idea of the communist global revolution is not there, uh, the ex-Marxist working class doesn't see any reason to be internationalist anymore. And I do believe this is quite important because in a certain way, uh, part of these uh, uh, ideologies were quite important for the, uh, 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 for the identity of Europe. And uh, Emmanuel Todt made a controversial, but in my view, interesting argument trying to explain why some of the ex-communist voters in France went so much to the National Front. And he said, this is paradoxically the perversion of universalism. So if you believe that all people are the same and equal, and some of the foreigner comes, and they're not like you, so probably they're not human. Uh, so from this point of view, you see this type of a backlash of universalism, which I found uh, very important to discussing some of uh, uh, the things that are going to happen. And of course, the migration crisis make very clear the clash between uh, West and East of Europe. Uh, uh, for many people, this was simply the scandal of Eastern Europe. Uh, because unlike places like uh, Germany, unlike places like Sweden, unlike places like Austria, uh, what you had in most of our countries was very strong anti-refugee sentiment in the absence of refugees. This was what shocked people. Why? And I'll try to give you some explanation because I do believe that this is going to help us to understand some of the problems which migration, in my view, are going to create for the European Union. One of the important thing about Central and Eastern Europe that people rarely talk about because it's obvious is that most of our nation states after the end of the World War are the results of ethnic cleansing. The level of ethnic homogeneity in most of our countries is incredibly high. And in 1939, one third of the population of Poland were non-Poles. There were Germans, uh, there were Jews, there were Ukrainians, not because of the Poles, by the way, uh, not to blame the Poles for this. After the end of the war, you ended up with society in which 95% of the population was Poles. And as a result of it, particularly for the countries and the states where the communism was for many reasons unpopular, like in Poland, this ethnic homogeneity became one of the major sources of the legitimacy of the communist elites. So you have this paradox in which the communist governments were speaking internationalism, but it was very much the type of an ethnic nationalism which was what was giving them a certain degree of, uh, uh, of legitimacy. And secondly, even if you go back to the 1968, you're going to see that 1968 has a very different uh, colors in Western Europe and in Eastern Europe. In Western Europe, it was very much about the solidarity with those who are not like us. It was Vietnam, it was uh, uh, Third World, uh, it was a uh, different type of utopias, but it was very much internationalist in its making. In Eastern Europe, 1968 was about national, national awakening. It was true for the Poles, it was true for the Czechoslovakia, uh, it was true for everybody. It was basically trying to defend our sovereignty uh, uh, against, uh, against the Soviet Union. So from this point of view, paradoxically, uh, uh, unlike in Western Europe, where because of the nationalistic rhetoric of the fascist regimes, internationalism and the internationalist language was perceived as a resistance, as a response to the past. In Eastern Europe, because of the internationalist language of the communist regimes, nationalistic discourse was a part of the resistance discourse. Uh, and I'm saying this because there are three other, in my view, important things that explain this behavior out of the position of the leaders that are making manipulation. And uh, of course, there was a lot of politics. I don't believe that without Mr. Orban and others, everything was going to be the same. But when people start to talk about propaganda, propaganda works when you're touching on something real. And from this point of view, the other three things that were critically important to understand this European behavior first is the demographic panic of a small ethnic nations who starts to fear that they can disappear. Let's give you Bulgarian data. Bulgaria, a nation of around 8.59 million uh, in 1989, with almost 10% of the population who left for the last 25, 30 years. According to the UN projections in 2050, 2050 we're also going to lose 
27% of our population. It's an aging and emigrating society. And suddenly, when you see all these images because of the people coming, because for, for good reasons, Bulgaria was not one of the places through which most of the people had been emigrating, so we didn't see so much real people, you start to ask the question, is in 100 years there going to be anybody there speaking Bulgarian anymore? Uh, and this is something that is real. It's very difficult to be explained. It's not about jobs. It's something which is much more profound when nation starts to discover their mortality. The second thing is the capacity of the state. When the German chancellor said, we can do it, we can integrate, even people who are strongly against receiving refugees knew that the German state can do it if they decided to do it. East European states were not able to make this statement because for the last 30 years and even much longer period, we failed to integrate the Roma community that is living in our countries in a certain way for all these years, and they are not foreigners, they have been there forever. The level of the failure of integration of the Roma communities of all East European countries <laughs> is one, in my view, of the sources of a total mistrust of the population that any type of an integration really is going easily to work. But the certain probably for you is going to be the most unexpected uh, uh, explanation on my side for the way societies and not governments reacted on one or the other is that if you look at the German elections and try to see who is the strongest predicator for which regions are going to vote for the alternative for Germany party, you're going to be surprised that this is not the regions that got most of the refugees but this is the regions from which most people has left for the last 30 years. This is not simply the fear of migrants, but the trauma of emigration that make this. Because the very fact that you are living in a place which a lot of people are living, particularly young, energetic people, is devaluing your place, nevertheless, how you're living there. You feel as a loser for simply being there. And I do believe this very much explains uh, this type of... Uh, uh, at this type of behavior. And this is why the East-West divide that was opened by the, uh, 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 by the refugee crisis led to the major changes in the way some of these European societies are perceiving European Union and European Union project. Keep in mind that even now the two most pro-EU friendly public opinions in the European Union are Poland and Hungary. This is the latest Eurobarometer. But at the same time, keep in mind that 51% of the polls declare that if they are going to be pressure on them to receive uh, uh, refugees and migrants, and if they should choose between this and leaving the European Union, they're going to leave the Union. Listen, this opinion polls, people should not make of the opinion polls more than they are. But I do believe this important tendency because as a result of this crisis, two things happened. First, we see the rise of something which I'm going to call use Euroscepticism. For example, in places like Poland, skepticism to the EU now is stronger in the younger generation. And secondly, before the crisis, as a rule, East Europeans trusted European institutions more than their national governments. And the logic was very clear. We don't know what they're doing in Brussels, but they cannot be worse than our own. <laughs> no, this, this is fair. Uh, I mean, a mistrust is important. After the crisis, the idea was probably they're better than our own, but they care less for us. And as a result of it, basically, the trust in the national governments became higher than the trust in the European institutions. I'm saying this because I'm going to make the, the last uh, uh, point, which is not migration connected. Because this crisis started, because you see all these tendencies, because you see governments, in particular in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, which are becoming much uh, tougher in the negotiations and their participation in the European Union, uh, most of the people started to talk about this as a crisis of democracy. And as a result of it, basically, uh, we see uh, the crisis of democracy being uh, the, uh, the intellectual frame through which the problems of the European Union uh, have been discussed. What I'm claiming in the book is that we have a crisis of democracy on the national level. Paradoxically, the rise of the referendums and the spread of the referendums are part of the response to this. I know that what I'm going to say here is not going to be very popular in Switzerland, but I do believe that while referendums could be quite important as a response for uh, reforming democracy on the national level, the spread of the referendums 
is the way that basically can destroy the European Union, nevertheless, of the nature of the referendums and nevertheless how people vote. For a very simple reason, referendum is the final word of the nation. Referendums cannot negotiate with each other. And European Union is a negotiating space. If you see the spread of the referendums, in a certain way, if European Union decides to commit a suicide, the weapon of choice is going to be a referendum. And it's going to be a small referendum. So it's not about in or out. It's going to be like the Dutch referendum about the Ukrainian trade agreement about nobody has hurt. Or the Hungarian referendum on the refugees or the Italian referendum. But as a result of it, you start to block the process and in a certain way trying to increase the veto power of the member states because basically you cannot renegotiate these referendums. But what I'm arguing is that in a certain way, the major crisis of the European Union is not the crisis of democracy, but the crisis of the meritocratic view of society. What is in crisis is the idea of the meritocracy, and meritocracy very much understand is a society in which basically people who best give exams govern. And here's the paradox. Parents are ready to give a lot of money to their kids to go to the best schools like this, but when the election days come, they don't want to vote for people who graduated from these schools. And this is, this is a new moment. Part of it can be explained by the fact that, of course, the financial crisis of 28-29 made a very, uh, it was a major problem for the competence of the elites. The famous uh, remark of the English British Queen, how you didn't get it, uh, uh, to the leading British economists. I do believe that there is something deeper than this, and I'm just going to uh, give four very brief arguments why meritocratic elites started to be very much mistrusted, while keeping in mind that particularly in Brussels, meritocratic elites are not particularly corrupt. I don't know, probably compared to some of the Nordic countries, they were corrupt. Compared to the South, not only to the East, I do believe it's a, it's a quite fair type of people. Secondly, they have a humble background. This is not people who come from a privileged fam families and so on. They did through education, they went through exams, and so on. So uh, from this point of view, we're not talking about kind of a corrupt, uh, 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 greedy elites, which normally. Where is the problem then? And I do believe that there are four issues that I want to suggest before I'm going to finish. The first is the meritocratic society, and Michael Young, who introduced the term in 1958, knew it very well, is a very unequal society. The gap between the winners and losers is not simply a very big gap, but also meritocracy produces a winners who are arrogant by definition. By the way, the most easy way to distinguish a meritocratic elite from any other is meritocrats never use luck when they're explaining their own success. Normally, people are going to say, I was lucky for this and that. People who did it the right way, they're never lucky. Everything was the result of their effort, their talent. Uh, uh, but secondly, uh, as a result of it, because they did it the right way, because they did it according to the rules, they don't have the feeling that they owe anything to anybody. Uh, we can talk many things about the traditional aristocratic elites, for example, in Britain in the beginning of the 20th century. But there is one figure which you probably know and you should keep in mind. During the World War I, the percent of the people coming from the high classes in Britain is much higher. Uh, killed, I'm sorry. The percent of the people being killed in the World War I coming from the high classes in Britain is much higher than the percent of people being killed coming from the lower classes. In the time of war, they believed that they have an obligation to be there, and you have all these uh, young kids from Oxford and Cambridge who go and volunteer. This is not the case anymore. People are saying that in the Blair government, there was not a single person whose uh, son or daughter was in the army. Uh, so from this point of view, you have this idea of the elites for which their competence is the only source of legitimacy and who does not think very much in terms of sacrifice. Secondly, I do believe part of the crisis of meritocracy has something to do with the fact that education starts to deliver less than was the case before. I do believe that for the liberals, education is what for the Marxists is the nationalization of the means of production. This is the fundamental kind of answer to all questions. 
Uh, but as a result of it, you see a diminishing return of education, particularly when we're not talking about an elite universities and institutions. But if you see what is happening with, uh, in, uh, in the United States with uh, uh, some of uh, uh, not great colleges and universities, people go with the idea that if you're going to graduate university, you're going to have a good money and you're going to have a good job. And now we're entering the age of unemployed graduates, which was not the case before. But the most important and the last argument which I want to do is that what scared people a lot about meritocratic elites is their mobility. They have a competence which is convertible. You can be a good banker in Sofia, but if you're talented, you can do the same in Geneva and so on. So in the time of crisis, the elites has an exit option. And in Greece, this option was very much exercised by the part of the elites. People do not have an exit option. I was asking, in, 10 years ago, if you speak a foreign language, in an election, it's very much increasing your chance to be elected in places like Bulgaria. These days, I notice that speaking a foreign language, better not say this. Uh, because people say, listen, he speaks a foreign language. When the problems come, he'll go to Geneva or to Brussels. People want somebody who is going to stay with them. And from this point of view, the mobility, this makes people to believe that globalization is the liberation, but liberation of the elites. They are not dependent neither on the voter nor on the taxpayer in the way they have been before. I'm saying this because the, the, my conclusion is, if we see the migration crisis and the crisis of meritocracy as the two major crises through which the European Union is going, we can probably better understand the nature of the populist parties. And of course, populist parties are very different. And uh, uh, I always like to uh, tell a joke. And this is the only Swiss joke that I know, but it works very well for me methodologically. So I cannot stop not telling it. But the joke is about the French, German, and Swiss boy, eight, nine year old, who started to discuss where the babies come from. And the German boy said, they come from the sky. And uh, my parents see it in front of the door. And the French boy start laughing and said, of course, they come from the bedroom. But then the Swiss boy became nervous. And he said, do not generalize. It's different from canton to canton. <laughs> uh, I'm saying this because I do believe this is also true with populism. It's different from canton to canton. But I do believe that about populist parties, there are three things that are important and they're common. First. All of them insist on the primacy of the political. From this point of view, they're classical democratic phenomena. For example, they fight on the left much more the position that market is something almost like nature, and the voter cannot do much more about it. And on the right, that migration is something like nature, and the voter cannot do much more about it. Right or wrong, never tell the voter that nothing can be done about something because why he should vote if this is the case. And the fact that you can do, and simply basically governments are not doing because they don't want to do it, is something that is quite important and part of the anti-elite story. The second is, of course, they're strongly majoritarian and anti-pluralist because the majority for them, unlike the liberal democracy in which majority is temporal, this is much more coalition of minority, for them majority is not something that is produced simply by votes, it's produced by history. And this essentialism of majority is very strong, and you can see it very strong in all these countries. But what is quite interesting, and which makes the current populism very different than both the fascists and the communists in the 1930s that people like to talk about is, this is empowering a people in the absence of a common political project. This is not pedagogical regime. Both fascists. Uh, Christian Democrats, communists, they didn't like people in the way they are, but in the way they could be. Populists now treat the people in the way the market treats them. I like you in the way you are. I don't want to change you. I simply want to speak for you, nevertheless, what kind of a bullshit you're speaking. So from this point of view, there is not ideological ambition there. This is much the fact that majority is majority. I'm saying this because, in my view, and this is my really last sentence, the different, the, what makes populists so strong is that they portray themselves as the party of loyalty. We are here to stay. We have nowhere to go. And even if we don't have an answer to the question, at least you can trust us that we're going to be with you. On the other side, they succeeded, and the elites also contributed a lot to be perceived as the party of exit. The idea is we're here, 
We try to do it better. If it does not work, we are living. And I do believe that this situation makes it so difficult for the European Union to reach to the voters, because what voters now demand is a loyal elite. And this is something that meritocratic elites don't know how to be. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much. As usually, you have always very crystal and clear and very sharp. And uh, my name is Aki Mello. I was your student last year. And I really enjoyed your course. Now, I have a question um, concerning the fact about uh, homogeneity in Poland. Now, last, last summer, I had the chance to work for some weeks in Poland. And I, I really saw what actually you are saying about the Polish population. When you are talking about the fact that the international communist idea was international but very much national and homogeneity on the national level, it came in my mind the case of Yugoslavia, which actually is completely the contrary because um, homogeneity and the ethnic cleansing only happened after the communist regime collapsed. So how do you uh, compare these two situations and actually the Balkans might be now with Slovenia, Croatia, they are, in the future they will become member of the more enlarged European Union. How do you see that process in comparison to Poland? Thanks. It's a two-way question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, and this is a great question because uh, we, I can imagine here there are people who have been doing Yugoslavia who I know very well. One of the major problems in the crisis of Yugoslavia was that when you talk to Serbs and Croats and others, uh, their wars and even kind of ethnic cleansing and others was not anti-European. They said, we want to be a normal European country. We want to be ethnic cleansed like others. And don't forget the most important identity that have been destroyed during the Yugoslav war was the Yugoslav identity. There were 17% of the Bosnian citizens in 1992 who defined themselves as Yugoslavs. They didn't want to define themselves as Serbs or Croats and others. But when a civil war starts, if you're a Yugoslav, you don't have sight. And it's not by accident that the Yugoslav identity survived mostly for people who left Yugoslavia. They're going to define themselves as Yugoslavs because others basically should take side. They should basically go either Serb or Croat or Muslim and others in order to survive in this type of a confrontation. At the end of the communist period, multiculturalism was defined, and of course this term was not used, but diversity was, as the major security, political, cultural problem. This was at the very moment when, in the West of Europe, this was perceived as a positive development. And I do believe from this point of view, when people talk about, for example, diversity and multiculturalism to East Europeans, they said, you want to go back to the 1930s when we used to have minorities and most of these minorities have been security problem? Remember what happened with the German minorities in Poland, Czech Republic, this was one of the reasons all this started. So from this point of view, the problem of ethnic homogeneity, which is now very much used, in, in my view, in a very brutal way by some of the governments there, is critically important because this is what divides Eastern Europe and Western Europe much more than anything else. Uh, and from this point of view, the fact that East European countries does not have a colonial history is also quite important. There is no first encounter with other people. There is no curiosity. Very few of us have been living uh, outside of Europe. We're much more Eurocentric than others. There is no guilt. 
There is no guilt on this. So from this point of view, I do believe that the problem of ethnic homogeneity, and listen, this is strange ethnic homogeneity, because at the same time, there are now almost half a million Ukrainians working in Poland as a labor migrants. So this is not that people, and at the same time, most of our people from our countries are traveling, living in other places. Uh, 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 but this is, is it good or bad? Uh, and from this point of view, I have been always kind of in myself entertaining the following survey. Because we have the fear of the migrants, the next kind of a wave is going to come, the fear of the robots, because technological changes uh, is very important. I was trying to see in different countries, in an opinion poll, what they should prefer to work with, to be taken care of. A foreigner from different culture or a robot. And I do believe it's going to be interesting because countries are going, my hypothesis is going to be that Japan will go for the, uh, for the robots. Uh, and it's not by accident because this is one of the places where ethnic homogeneity is made extremely important and so on. So we're going, the idea of diversity is now going to have also a technological dimension, not simply a uh, different cultural dimension. And this is, uh, uh, and also there is a lot of talk about politics of fear. Here I want to make, because for me this is a major distinction. I have seen fearful people. And do you know what? Fearful people are very careful with words. I have never seen somebody who is really fearful shouting bullshit. Because you know that something has happened. It's not by accident that countries like Bulgaria that have been on the border and which really basically has a much more real fear of something can happen, were not the most vocal countries during this crisis uh, in anti-refugee uh, sentiment. Anxiety is something different. You have a lot of anxiety in which people feel their comfort zone is destroyed, but they don't know exactly what they fear. So in a certain way, they start shouting, preventing something that they cannot identify. Uh, and of course, here uh, also come the political entrepreneurs, which started uh, uh, to use it very skillfully. Uh, but as I said before, in order to use something, it should be there. Thank you very much for the excellent talk. I'm a PhD candidate at the Institute in Political Science. Do you expect that people will unite against the robots and maybe uh, come over, you know, uh, solve the problems of ethnicity? Uh, there is a famous book in international relations uh, who is trying to explain all the theories of international relations based on zombies. What is going to happen if the zombies are going to invade the world? And it depends on your theory. According to the realists, at some point, some countries are going to make an alliance with the zombies. Uh, uh, but I do believe that uh, I do believe that one thing that is happening is that we see a lot of redefinition of political identities on different things, and this is why this famous uh, Harvard study uh, on uh, uh, the populist clash, which uh, was. Uh, very much on the base of uh, uh, the world value surveys with Englehart and uh, Norris who are trying to see economic factors or cultural factors are coming as a big explanation, gave some prevalence to the cultural factor globally. The story is that we are also living in a world in which people try to choose all their identities. Do you know the percent of the Americans who change their religion in their lifetime? Can anybody guess what is the percent of the Americans today who change their religion in their lifetime? 40. 40% 40 of the Americans change. Listen, changing religion means that... Uh, confession. No, no, confession. I mean, they can, you can go from one uh, to evangelical, but also you can go to secular. But this is one of the most traditional and difficult things to change. I'm saying this because, uh, uh, like everybody, we are very much fascinated with Hirschman and uh, uh, Shalini organized a conference with the Institute at IWM about Hirschman. If you see his idea of exit voice and loyalty, he takes loyalty for granted. Because loyalty is not trust. Loyalty is something that prevents you to, to exit. You're not exiting, he believes your family easily. He believes that divorce is something which is difficult. Leaving your religion, leaving your country. Imagine that all this is not as difficult anymore. 
And then starts to come different type of choices. David Goodhart wrote a book people uh, about trying to divide, uh, claiming that the major divide in societies today is much more the British data is between what he called people from somewhere and people from anywhere. And people from somewhere, they come with a given identities. This is much more traditional identities that you came from, your parents and so on, and people from anywhere are much more about choosing their identities. So from this point of view, I don't know, listen, the robots, first of all, they're not going to be robots. They're going to be my robot or your robot. They're going to have a national passports. Listen how people talk about security. When President Putin said, who controls artificial intelligence is going to dominate the world, he believes that they're going to be his artificial intelligence and American artificial intelligence. So you like your artificial intelligence and you don't like others. So from this point of view, I cannot see the world united against robots. About the robots, I don't know. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Um, I have a question on, the, um, on young people in, in the EU and European elections. In opinion polls, young people seem to be, in general, quite pro-European. But when the European elections to the European Parliament come, they usually don't go to vote that much. Uh, what would you do to change this trend and to motivate young people to, to vote? What would be your strategy? But listen, this is a great question, because this is also one of the things that we take for granted, that the young vote in general is much more pro-EU and much more liberal than others. There was a study being done uh, in 14 of the EU member states in 2014, so it's before the refugee crisis. And here is an interesting on the difference between the younger, we're talking about people younger than 35. They are more liberal when it comes to sexual minorities. It's true, it's the exception of one country, which is Hungary. There is no plurality of young people under 35 who are going to be very strongly opposed to gay marriage. There are some who are not going to strongly support and so on. But when you talk about sexual minorities, the generational perspective is stronger. When it comes to refugees and migration, there is no difference between generations. Secondly, in many of the countries, the young people are much more going to side with populist vote. For example, in Poland, on the last elections, 60% of the people younger than 35 voted either for the governing party of Mr. Kaczynski or on the right of Mr. Kaczynski. The idea that young people are automatically pro-European and uh, much more liberal uh, is not true everywhere. We have this because of the vote and the referendum in Brexit on Britain. We basically universalize Britain. But even if you go to something that you know better than me, and this is France, go on the first round of the presidential elections, and you're going to see that Mr. Macron does not get uh, uh, the majority of the EU's vote. And to be honest, Mrs. Uh, Merkel was elected mainly because of being overrepresented of women between uh, 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 older than 60. The interesting thing that is coming from all elections is different, the gender vote. In a certain way, the most interesting is the difference between young women and young men. Young men being much more ready to vote for particularly right-wing populist parties, and young women being, in a certain way, the most reliable liberal voter. In Austria, when uh, President van der Bellen was elected, uh, uh, this was exactly because of a very high percent of the young uh, uh, women vote. This is interesting, because these people are going to marry each other. No, no, but this is, I do believe this is, this is good and this is quite important. Uh, but this is important because part of, for sure, also part of the source of populism, because in my, and I don't want uh, uh, to spend on this, but uh, the term that I very much use in concerning the populist vote is that this representation of the threatened majorities. So these are people who do not want to be empowered, but who fear that they are losing power, nevertheless they are majority. And part of it, of course, is the white male vote. Look at the United States. Uh, for the first time, you have more women graduating college than men. 
you're going to see a change also of the way people are starting to be paid. And also the more robots you have, in a certain way, the less heroes you need. Uh, you're moving to a jobs and others where in a certain way women are much more competitive. You are right to have no sympathy to the old white men like me, but on the other side, you should believe that they also vote. And in a certain way, to believe that they should be happy with what is happening is also totally unrealistic. So from this point of view, the youth vote is not so united. It's very much the education divide is a huge divide. The other thing that happened is that you have too many people in the universities these days, too many I mean compared to the previous periods, to the extent that the young people in universities are starting to believe that they are the young people. But I'm going to give you one more kind of interpretation of this. You can see a lot of people on the streets, young people protesting, particularly in Eastern Europe. You can see a lot of young people protesting. At the same time, you cannot see much of them being influential in the political process. And I was trying to answer myself why. And very quickly, three things. The youth cohort compared to his 1968 are numerically weak. There are not enough young people. To be honest, if you're an East European politician, it's not the young which is going to solve your problem. So from this point of view, they feel weak in the ballot box. Secondly, at the same time, they feel very powerful in front of the computer because they're empowered by social media and others and so on. So uh, they feel so powerful that they don't have the feeling that they need the vote. And you have a quite low electoral turnout among the young voters because why to express your dissatisfaction through voting for a party when you go and can write uh, in your social media how you feel and what you want to change and so on. So from this point of view, they don't perceive voting as the way to be empowered because they feel empowered much more by new technologies and others. And thirdly, these are the people, particularly in Eastern Europe, who are most ready and much more discussing leaving their countries if they don't want. It's much more the exiters. Listen, if you are not sure are you going to stay in a country, then basically you're not going to be very much sure how much you want to commit to a political change. There is a famous joke in Bulgaria. Uh, I want to deliver jokes because this is the only thing that is going to stay with you. Uh, but uh, three persons uh, dressed like uh, Japanese samurai walk on the streets of Sofia and the bystander asks them, who are you? They said, we're the seven samurais and we're here to make this place a better place. But why are you only three? The other four are working abroad. Uh, 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 so from this point of view, there is the problem of the critical mass of people also. You need the critical mass in order to make a change. So I don't know, from this point of view, the idea that it's enough to mobilize the young people in order to solve Europe's problem could be also a major electoral fallacy. And because you mentioned European elections, just for those of you who are better than me in mathematics, Let's give you a, a, a suggestion for a paper. We know on previous European Parliament elections what is the coefficient of overrepresentation of the Protestant Eurosceptic parties. Now, when you know what is the support for these parties on the national elections, try to calculate if they use the same, if the coefficient is going to be the same. How big is going to be the representation of these parties in the next European Parliament. And you can end up with the fact that in the European Parliament, the biggest group of MPs can be people coming from openly Eurosceptical or protest parties. So from this point of view, uh, European elections, by the way, could be one of the major points of political crisis for the European Union exactly for this, because this election is a low turnout, and mostly kind of those who does not like European Union are much more motivated to vote than others. At least this is the pattern that we know till now. It could change, but, uh, you know, we're in the world of patterns. <clears throat> oh, uh, I would like first to thank you about the wonderful lecture and the interesting anecdotes that you brought us tonight. Um, since we mentioned a couple of times Poland today, I would like also to ask a question about it. So it's, it has become more or less some kind of a regular event. So a couple of days ago on the 11th of November, we saw again this huge protest in Warsaw. And um, 
for me as a young person, I am really a bit offended from uh, this act. And I would like to ask you, do you believe that such events happening in one of the, one of, however, one of the biggest uh, European capitals, how, how can we counter such acts? How, how could we stop them from uh, influencing other maybe fragile Euro Euro European countries like we saw in Eastern Europe? How could we counter such events so they don't affect younger generation? Because we mentioned this also today. And uh, I'm just wondering what could you suggest about such major events which are happening nowadays in the streets of Warsaw? And um, for younger people, I believe that it's not a very pleasant sight to see if we are pretending to be uh, Europeans and defending European values. So I would like you to hear. To hear Think your not a poll. Yeah. It's easier for me. You have yesterday here a great Polish speaker, so you should have. Uh, but I, I was in Gdansk three days ago, so let's try. First of all, what I'm going to say is not going to be profound, but for people, I, I can imagine that the people who are not following Poland on a daily basis. If you want to imagine Poland, imagine the United States today. It's a deeply divided society. There is use on one side, there is use on the other side. They are divided on many things. This is historically divided society. And what makes Poland quite different than many of East European countries is they have a much more strong sense of subjectivity. Poles, most of other East Europeans, uh, we're not sure how much we make history. We're sure that we are part of it. But uh, also in our national discourses, we try to be mainly the victim of history. This is not Poland. This is the only East European country that had a really an important and impressive resistance and social society movement. 10 million people were members of Solidarity Movement in 1981. 10 million people in a country of 40 million. Uh, just to imagine the moment, I'm going to give you the example which always is striking most of this period. During the high solidarity year 1980-1981, the consumption of alcohol in Poland was reduced four times. Uh, no, but this is important, the excitement of the public. You really have a nation being drunken with, with freedom, which is, uh, I'm saying it in a very positive way. Why I'm saying this, from this point of view, in order to understand the Polish position, it's very much about politics of resentment and pride. Uh, um, also, and this is, this is interesting, and when I was talking about the erosion of the universalist nature of the Catholic, uh, uh, Polish Catholicism is a major story. This has something to do with this. Uh, because in a certain way, Poles believe that they stay for Europe in the way they understand it. Christian Europe, Europe without foreigners, what the Hungarian prime minister is telling these days. To be honest, the Europe that they know, and the fact that some of these people have been traveling and working abroad and so on, they got some of the Islamophobia not living in Poland but living in West European societies and living basically next uh, uh, to some of the foreigners coming from other countries. But they're two Poland's. So from this point of view, it's going to be wrong to believe that these people that have been on the streets. Uh, secondly, there was always a strong nationalistic tradition in Poland. There is not something new. Uh, even in the solidarity movements, there were two solidarities. And when you say what could be done, I don't believe that Brussels is going to give. Listen, just punishing Poland is not going to work. And I'm going to tell you why it's not going to work. Uh, the, when the constitutional changes started, there was a lot of people on the street protesting this. So on the question, do you support the constitutional changes suggested by the, uh, the government of Mr. Kaczynski, the majority of the Poles said no. <laughs> Second question, do you support Brussels punishing Poland for this? No. Because it's sovereignty. Poles believes that they should deal on their own. How this is going to affect the other part of Europe? And this is a great question, but it's not going to be institutionally. There is one thing that I really believe is very important and positive about this crisis. We started to be interested in each other. You are not specialist on Poland. I mean, you're not doing dissertation on Poland. But for you, Poland is important. And there are people who are not specialists on Greece, who started to be interested in the Greek economy. And now everybody is specialist on Germany, for sure. Uh, there is a very strong anti-German rhetoric in Poland. Uh, there, I know a good joke, which this time I'm not going to tell you, <laughs> because it's uh, already kind of a 
to East European for this. Uh, but the idea that Poland is always fighting on two fronts and so on, this is part of Polish history. And we should help our societies to overcome this history. And this is going to take time. And here's something that I'm going to suggest, which also is not going to make me very popular. I was always trying, when seeing the crisis and talk about populism and so on, I decided to reread things being written by establishment liberals at the end of 1960s and 1970s. Highly respectful people. People like Raymond Theron, uh, uh, on the American side, the famous The Crisis of Democracy Report of 1973 of Huntington's and others. They believed that it was the end of the world. It was all this adversary class that they say they're coming, all these intellectuals, all these leftists who are going to destroy everything and so on. Joschka Fischer, for them, was not looking much more different than some of the right-wing radicals look today. He was on the streets throwing bombs, uh, or stones at least. There was a major, any time when the word of populism comes, obviously we're seeing a transformation of democracy. In a certain way, then, it was a very much opening, progressive, liberal kind of a challenge to the democratic institutions in the 1970s. I do believe now we say, see the same, but much more coming from the right. And both of these groups talk about democracy. Then it was much more the democracy and the freedom of the individual. So it was much more the anti-authoritarian ethos of the people of the 1960s. Now it's much more the power of the majority. And if you're going to uh, allow me to risk with some theoretical distinction, 1990s and liberal democracy as we know it very much is based on the idea of recognition. And recognition, quite a lot of literature on this is, I insist on my equality, but I also I insist that you recognize that I'm different. Now the word which is very much used these days, particularly by the leaders of big countries like the United States or Russia is, Others do not respect us. Mr. Putin is sure that nobody respects Russia. Mr. Trump believes that the fact that Germans has a surplus, budget surplus, is disrespect for the United States. What is the difference uh, for, between recognition and respect? Respect means I also to recognize you that I am stronger than you. There is a power dimension. Recognition does not speak power. Respect does. The idea is we can pretend that you are equal, but you should keep that we are not. They are majorities and they are minorities. And from this point of view, when people today said we see the rise of identity politics, it's not true. 1990s was very much about identity politics, but the identity politics of the minorities. Now this type of identity politics is overtaken by the majorities, ethnic or religious, it depends on, uh, 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 on the country. So I do believe that in a certain way, this shift between the culture of recognition to the culture of respect is something that we're going through. And the question is, can democratic institutions do with this? Can they de-radicalize the right-wing populists in the way they have been de-radicalizing some of the radical left in the 1970s? In 1971, one third of the German public was sharing, if not uh, the means, the goals of the Red Army faction. I was going through an old, so this was a society event. This was not a group of kind of a radicals that were on their own. And many people were shocked because we're talking about Germany, which was so successful economically and so on, and then comes a generation who said everything is a failure. So from this point of view, at least for me, I could be very much wrong. And uh, one of the books that, to be honest, I want really to write, and I will not so this way I can tell it about it, is that I'm very much interested for people who got their time wrong. For example, people who in the 1930s believed that Hitler is an ugly guy, but we have seen many ugly guys. So they try to normalize. People like Ulrike Meinhof, extremely gifted person, who decided that there is no major difference between West Germany in 1970s and Nazi Germany in the 1930s. And one of the reasons they're making, in my view, this wrong uh, judgment is that they go with the wrong comparisons. And this is what I start to fear. If we believe that we are going through the 1930s again, not seeing some very important differences, for example, for the moment, most of these parties, as ugly as they are, do not believe in the purifying and transformative power of violence. It can change the people that you have seen on the street, uh, on the level, in some groups uh, which we saw in the US, but then violence was a commonplace. 
Uh, secondly, uh, the idea of the revolutionary beginning, not now. You have nostalgic, everyone to be great again. Uh, everybody is back looking. So from this point of view, this is where probably I'll go. Sorry for being long, but because for me this was kind of unfortunate. Uh, Emmanuel Renault, sociologist, uh, Geneva. Well, thanks first for your, for your lecture. It was really at the level of the presentation that you got uh, at the beginning of your talk. Uh, I would like, just like to come back to the, to the title of the, of the lecture, Europe, Fragility and Resilience. Uh, I have a feeling that fragility, the, the talk was pretty much uh, balanced toward um, fragility. Could you give us a little bit of element of resilience? Maybe you, you started, you you started in, 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 your, in your previous uh, yeah. uh, response, but maybe could you develop a little? Thank you very much. Uh, I keep the resilience for the conclusion also in the book. Uh, because in a certain way, it's not as pessimistic book as you're going to see on the title. First, it was written mostly at the end of 2016 when everybody believes that it's over, so you have Trump, and now it's going to one girl is going to win in France and another is going to lose in Germany and everything is going to be over. Uh, and I never believed this. Because paradoxically, most of this crisis is also that make the Europeans to go closer together, not simply on the level of institutions, but also politically. The result of Brexit was also the fact that now we have increased confidence in the European Union all over the, most of the countries. Secondly, Europe, in my view, is becoming much more political in the way it reacts. Because part of the story, and uh, I have been doing some work on the Soviet disintegration and others, is that in the times like this, flexibility matters, political. But also what I do believe is the following. The more the crisis develop, the more everybody starts to understand that disintegration of European Union is not a return to the nation states there is no way to return. If European Union is going to disintegrate, disintegrate, some of the member states are going to disintegrate. And from this point of view, Catalonia was a great example, Belgium is going to be a great example, and many others. Secondly, even for a kind of a very now loud countries like Poland and Hungary, it's not by accident that the public is so pro-European. You're radical till the moment you believe that European Union is there. Because does Poland want to be on its own in the surrounding world. So I do believe that one of the things that makes me much more positive is that uh, nevertheless that this crisis goes, and of course part of this crisis is that some of the sources of European Union for the previous period are not here anymore. For example, the experience of the World War II. The generations are not there. Uh, people don't remember in the way they have been remembering. Uh, people don't think in terms of the war. In a certain way, the war is perceived as unthinkable, and this was one of the, uh, the things that does not make Europeans thinking about this. Welfare state is not what it used to be in this global economy. And all this is there, but you start to have a new sources which are making people to understand why they're staying together even when they have a big differences. And in the book, I'm ending with a story because also the idea is what kind of leaders we need and uh, visionary leaders and so on. I never believed that the Trump is the end of European Union. I don't believe that Macron is the end of the crisis of the European Union. The idea that his coming and basically populism is dead was also, in my view, kind of a uh, narrative that is not going to stay. But there is a beautiful book by a Spanish author, Mr. Sarkas, which is called Anatomy of a Moment. And th this is, by the way, really a great book. And the book is the following. In 1981, you know the famous uh, coup d'etat attempt which was organized in, in Spain, and there are 40 minutes television coverage because when uh, the, the military entered the parliament, they forgot to stop the television. And for 40 minutes you have this, so this uh, colonel, he was even not a colonel, uh, 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 who was uh, uh, commanding the coup, he enters with his soldiers and he said to the more than 600 members of the Spanish parliament, everybody on the floor who is not going to go on the floor, we are going to kill him. And three people stand. Everybody went on the floor, but three people didn't go to the floor. And they didn't risk to shoot them. And psychologically, this was the returning model. Who are these three persons? Not the persons that you're going to believe that democracy was their life. 
One was the former Prime Minister Suarez, who used to be a Franco functionary most of his life. The other was the Ministry of Defense, who was a Franco general fighting the Republic. And the third was the leader of the Spanish Communist Party, who always believed in the facade nature of, democ of democracy. But these three decided to stand. And they changed the psychology of the moment totally to the extent that also is the important, of course, uh, 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 intervention of the king, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the coup was there. So from this point of view, I even don't know what kind of political leaders are going to do it. But I do believe that Europe has a chance exactly because European Union discovered its political nature. Before it, it was institutions were there. Uh, technocratically, it was there. People were not part of it. And people are discovering the institutions through the crisis and through the fear they can lose it. And here I'm ending because I started with the book with Habsburg Empire collapsing. But my story is people these days, when they fear about the European Union, are always asking the question how the Habsburg Empire collapsed. But the interesting question is why it didn't collapse in the previous hundred years when everybody is expecting it not to collapse. So my Positive stories, nothing is a bigger source of legitimacy than the survival itself. The very fact that European Union can survive the crisis gives it political legitimacy. And this is true for the nation states, it's true for everybody. So German poet Rilke has this beautiful line, he said, who speaks for victory, to endure is all. Well, we have shared a great moment. Thank you so much.